Seeing God's work in our lives is remarkable. It leaves a permanent reminder of how great He is. This is the fifth message in the series, Reasons to Believe. This message is entitled, I Believe Because of the Proof He Provided. Here is Pastor Dale O'Shields. I want to talk this evening about the fact that we can believe in Jesus because of the proof He provided, the proof that Jesus provided each one of us. In this series, we've been looking at uh, one of the gospel accounts, the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John is a very unique gospel. It's one of four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, John being the fourth gospel and the final gospel that was written. John wrote this gospel when he was an old man. He was probably in his uh, late, uh, early, early to mid-90s whenever he wrote these words to us that are so familiar, verses like John 3.16, a variety of verses that we often refer to and are very familiar with in our own lives. But he gave us this account of Jesus' life. Matthew had written his gospel primarily for the Jews, so the Jews would understand that Jesus was the Messiah, the King of the Jews, and Mark had written his gospel primarily for the Romans because the Romans needed to understand Jesus and his perspective on Jesus as as was presented to them. And then Luke writes his gospel primarily focused on the Gentiles or the Greeks. And while all of those gospels certainly apply to us, they had a unique uh, perspective to them. But when John gives us his gospel, that fourth and final gospel, he has a very unique, a very specific purpose that we've been looking at together, and it was what motivated him to give us the words that we find in the 21 chapters of the gospel of John. And he helped us to understand why he gave us this gospel in John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. We've been looking at these verses for the next last several weeks. Let me bring them back to your attention again. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written. John says, I've written what I've written here in these 21 chapters. These are written that you may, what's the next word? Believe, Believe, that you may believe. I wrote this so you would believe, so you'll become a believer, that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. One of the words that is quite frequently used in the Gospel of John, and it's found actually in these two verses twice, is the word believe or believing. John loves this word. He wants us to understand the importance, the power of faith, the power of believing. And every time that John uses this word in his gospel accounts, he uses it in a unique form. He never uses it as a noun. He always uses it as a verb. It's always something that moves you to action. That when John describes faith, he's not talking about having something you sort of tuck away in your pocket and pull out from time to time when you need it. No, he's talking about something that changes the way you think and changes the way you live. It actually causes your life to be different. It moves you in certain dimensions of life. It is an action word. It is a verb. And so John lays this out for us. And we've been talking about this idea of believing. How can you and I have this faith that moves us to action, that changes the way we think and changes the way we speak and changes the way we live? This is the kind of faith that John was portraying to us and the kind of faith that you and I need. And I talked the first week about having faith in Jesus because of the words that he spoke. And John goes to great depth in laying out for us the words of Jesus. And then we talked about having faith in Jesus because of the life that he lived. Jesus lived a supernatural life. And then the third week, I talked about the miracles that Jesus performed. We can have faith because he performed miracles. He's the miracle-working Savior. And then last weekend, I paraded before you six different individuals that had their lives changed by Jesus. And you and I can believe believe in Jesus because of the lives that he changed. But tonight I want to bring you on this Easter weekend to this final focus that we see that is found in the latter part of the gospel of John, where we understand that you and I can have faith in Jesus because of the proof Jesus himself provided us. Jesus himself, in his own nature, his character, his own actions, did something for us called the resurrection, that in this thing called the resurrection, he proved without any shadow of a doubt that indeed he was who he said he was and did what he said and is who he says he is. And so we understand tonight that this resurrection idea is extremely important. The experience of the resurrection in Jesus' life is vital to us. And so what I'm going to do for the next few moments, I'm going to lay out for you reasons to believe that Jesus rose from the grave. I think that every Christian needs to understand these things. 
Sometimes perhaps you haven't stepped back and said, why do I even believe this thing that Jesus rose from the grave? Is there any credibility to the story? And so I'm going to take just a few moments this weekend, if it's okay with you, I'm going to lay out for you six reasons that you can be confident that Jesus really did rise from the grave. This is helpful for you. It's helpful for your faith. It's also, if you're a believer in Christ, helpful for your witness to other people as you share your faith with others. And this thing of the resurrection, understand this, it's very important because the apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 17 through 20, listen to what he said about the resurrection. And if Christ has not been risen or has not been raised, then your faith is, what's the next word there? Useless. So I I would say that the resurrection is pretty important. Would you agree? If Christ has not been raised from from the dead or has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you're still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. Then he makes this statement in verse 20, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. Paul says this thing called a resurrection You need to understand that it's vital to your faith. It is a foundation to your faith. It is vital to how you live your life and the kind of belief that will move you toward the right kind of action. So are you ready for six reasons to believe that Jesus rose from the grave? Anybody excited to know this tonight? Okay. Six reasons that you can know that this thing called our faith in Christ is not just a bunch of baloney. It is absolutely true and solid, and you can bank your life on it. You can bank your eternity on it. Number one, the first reason is because Jesus' death was a real death. You might say, what does that have to do with resurrection? I'm going to show it to you. It's impossible to have a real resurrection if you don't have a real death. Can I get an amen? Amen. And there have been throughout the centuries a lot of different ideas about whether Jesus really died or not. Maybe he just sort of fainted and somebody put him in a tomb and then he sort of woke up later. And there's a lot of ideas related to that. But I want you to know tonight that the resurrection is real because Jesus' death was real. You and I have to be convinced that Jesus really died before we're convinced that Jesus really came back to life again. And so this fact that Jesus truly died and died for the sins of the world on the cross of Calvary. Listen to John's words in John chapter 19, beginning in verse 30, then I'll go down to verse number 33. He's on the cross. Jesus is on the cross as John is describing it here. And when he'd received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit, the Bible says, verse 33. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. Speaking of himself, he knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may, what's the word again? Believe. There's John using that word again, that you might have this verb in your life called belief or active faith. Jesus didn't just faint on the cross and wake up later. No, that did not, it's not what happened. No, he died there. And when Jesus died on the cross, he actually paid the price for every sin that has ever been committed. Romans 5, verse 6, you see that at just the right time, when we were still sinners or still powerless, Christ died. Christ died. Say it with me. Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this while we were still sinners. What does it say? Christ died for us. Why did he die and why is his death so important? Because his death on the cross was payment for our sin. The Bible says in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. And so Jesus had to As I talked about on Good Friday, he had to satisfy the justice of God by dying on our behalf on the cross. Had there been no death, we would still be guilty of our sins, but Christ died in our place. Jesus' death was a real death. It was not a fabricated death. Number two, the second thing I want you to know about the resurrection of Jesus is that not only was his death a real death, but his burial was a secure burial. The Gospels take great 
pain. I mean, that goes to great detail to help us to understand that Jesus' burial was very secure, very secure. Because if an empty tomb was going to be the sign that Jesus had risen from the grave, then that tomb needed to be a solidly secured tomb to avoid the propagation of a hoax. Because if it were not a secured tomb, then anyone could have come and stolen the body of Jesus away and claimed that he'd risen from the grave. But no, the Bible goes to great detail to help us to understand not only did Jesus die, but the tomb that Jesus was placed in was absolutely secured beyond any kind of ability for anyone to create some kind of hoax, there was a security to this. John 19, beginning in verse 38. Actually, actually, verse 41. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Now let's go to the Gospel of Matthew. We see Jesus being laid in the tomb, but Matthew tells us a little bit more about what this tomb was all about. The next day, this is chapter 27 of Matthew, the next day, the one after preparation, day, the chief priests and Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver, that's how they're speaking of Jesus now, that deceiver said, after three days, I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made. What's the next word? Secure. Give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he's been raised from the dead. The last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb, what's the word again? Secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting a guard. I'll tell you something, not only was Jesus' death a real death, but when they put him in a tomb, they made sure that no one could break into that tomb. They had Roman guards there and a stone that was rolled across that tomb's opening, and it was sealed with a Roman seal, and so it was secure. In fact, three times Matthew describes the, describes the tomb to us as being secure, secure, secure. He used that word three times to make sure we understood it, and that's why it's so important to us. Let's go to the third reason. Everybody still with me so far? Giving you six reasons why Jesus' resurrection is the real deal. Okay. Number three, Jesus' disciples became reliable witnesses after his resurrection and of his resurrection. They became reliable witnesses. To establish anything as true or reliable, consistent eyewitnesses have to be available. Not just one eyewitness, there needs to be multiple eyewitnesses that are telling the same story and telling it in in a similar fashion. An empty tomb wasn't proof enough. Although the tomb is empty, we're going to see that in just a moment. It was only the sight of a living Savior by eyewitnesses that would provide a solid testimony for people to believe that this actually happened. And Jesus actually provided this. There are multiple accounts in the Bible of Jesus physically and literally appearing to people after he is risen from the grave, proving he is indeed a living Savior. These are recorded in the Bible so that you and I will know about them and have confidence in what Jesus has done for us in his resurrection. John 20 again. Now, verse 11, notice what it says. Now, Mary, now Mary has gone to the tomb. It's early Easter morning, that sunrise morning. She's gone there. Mary Magdalene has gone to the tomb. Now, Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. She'd already seen that the stone was rolled away and saw two angels in white seated with where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. So here's Mary. She comes to the tomb. She wants to anoint Jesus' body with spices, and she comes and sees, my goodness, the tomb is rolled away. She wonders what's going on. So she bends over and looks inside, and there are two angels One sitting at the head of where Jesus would have been buried and one at the feet where Jesus would have been buried. And she sees these angels and they ask her, verse 13, woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. Can you imagine? This is a lady 
Mary Magdalene who had seven demons cast out of her and she'd become a follower of Jesus and she'd seen all that he'd gone through and watched him die on the cross. She had been there as, she, as Jesus died on the cross and she's simply going to the tomb to anoint the body of the one that she loved and the body is not there and so I'm sure she's deeply distressed. And she's asking, where did you put him? Where is he? And the angels say, you got to stop crying. And said, Why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away and I don't know where they put him. Verse 14, at this she turned. Do you see that there? At this she turned and saw who? Come on, help me out, church. This is Easter weekend. You can be a lot more excited than that. Who did she see? Jesus. She saw Jesus. She turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize, at least initially, that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her one word. What was the word? Her name, Mary. She turned toward him and cried in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Mary Magdalene, then verse 18 says, she went to the disciples with the news. Notice what she says. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Chapter 20 of John, verse 19, on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, when the, with the doors locked for the fear, for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they, what does it say? They saw the Lord. Look at chapter 20, verse 24. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. That verse that I, verses I just read to you. He was not there. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hands into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them through the doors. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, same thing he said last time, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said, my Lord and my God. So Mary met the resurrected Savior, and the disciples encountered the resurrected Savior, saved Thomas, and then Thomas had his own encounter with the resurrected Savior. Look at chapter 21. Notice another encounter that the disciples have with, with the resurrected Savior. In the early, early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but his disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, have you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat. You'll find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John himself, said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he'd taken it off and jumped into the water. And the Bible says he goes to him there on the seashore and they have breakfast together. It was there in that moment that he restores him. He says to Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? He's restored back in relationship with Christ. Why? Because he has an encounter. Are you hearing me this weekend? Here are people, eyewitnesses who had encounters with Jesus. Mary Magdalene had an encounter with the resurrected Jesus. The, 11, the 10 disciples had an encounter because Judas was already away at that point. Thomas was not present the first time. And so those 10 disciples had an encounter with Jesus. Thomas had his own encounter with Jesus. And then later the disciples again have an encounter with Jesus. And then notice as we go now to the New Testament book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and let's talk about Paul's encounter with the resurrected Savior. I passed, Paul writes and says, I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scriptures say. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as scripture said. He was seen by Peter and then by the 12. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are who are still alive, th though some have died. Then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. Last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw 
him. I also saw him. What is Paul saying? He's describing the time. He's at the, on the road to Damascus. He's heading to Damascus to persecute Christians. And on the way there, he's smitten with a light from heaven. He's knocked to the ground. And the voice from the heaven comes to him and says, who are you? Why are you persecuting me, Saul? Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he had an encounter with a resurrected Savior. I want to tell you something tonight, this Easter weekend. I want you to know we have some reliable eyewitnesses that before Jesus ascended back to the right hand of God the Father, the witnesses say, I saw him, 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 500 that saw him. And Paul, even out of his own time of this experience, saw him as well. We have reliable proof that people actually testify of seeing the resurrected Savior. See, our faith is not some faulty little faith that we sort of have to worry about it standing up against something. No, it's strong. It's strong. Number four, can you tell I'm getting a little bit excited here? Okay. The witnesses of Jesus' resurrection were forever changed by their interaction with him. That's how we know that Jesus rose from the grave. It's another reason. The witnesses were forever changed by their interaction with him. When someone sees something remarkable, it leaves a mark on their life, right? If it's remarkable, it leaves a mark on your life. That's what the word means, remarkable. It marks you in some way. It's the whole idea. None of the disciples were the same after they saw Jesus. The res- they were not the same. Do you remember what happened when Jesus was being crucified? Do you remember, in fact, before he's even being crucified, that he's out in this, this, this environment where the chief priests and the Roman soldiers are beating on him before they take him to his crucifixion, and Peter is there, and the disciples, other, other disciples have fled, they've run away, and Peter's sitting over there warming himself by the fire, and a little girl asks him, do you know him, aren't you one of his? And he says, no, I don't know him. I mean, a little girl asks him, he's so afraid to admit that he's a part of Jesus' disciple band that he, he denies him three times. And then when Jesus goes to the cross, none of his disciples went with him to the cross with the exception of John. John is the only disciple that stood by Jesus at the cross as as he was being crucified. Why? Because they were all afraid. They were afraid that they were going to be put to death. They were afraid that they were going to be associated with the one who was going to be crucified. But after they met the resurrected Jesus, everything changed. They became bold people. Their despair turned to joy. Their fear turned to boldness. Their doubt turned to faith. Their shame turned to forgiveness. Everything changed in their lives. Why? Because they'd met the one that changed them. Notice 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. John writes these words, We proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. This one who is life itself was revealed to us, and we have seen him. And now we testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal life. He was with the Father, and then he was revealed to us. We proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that you may fully share our joy. John says, I want you to know that this testimony of seeing this resurrected Savior, we touched him with our hands, we saw him with our eyes, and we want you to believe as well so you can experience the same kind of joy that we're experiencing in our lives. The fifth reason that we can believe that Jesus is the, indeed is the Son of God, the Messiah. For over 2,000 years, for over 2,000 years, the message And the life-changing power of the living Jesus continues to be proclaimed and experienced for over 2,000 years. Think about it for a moment. Think about all that's happened over the 2,000 years. We're in 2021 now. and Jesus died somewhere around 33 AD. It's about that time frame that Jesus was crucified, rose from the grave, and ascended back. To God the Father. What is one thing that's been consistent for all those years up until today? And what are we doing even in this very room and online this weekend? 
we're talking about one person, and what is his name? Jesus. We're preaching one message. What message are we preaching? Christ crucified and Christ risen from the grave. For over 2,000 years, this message continues to be preached, but it's not just something that is preached and proclaimed. It continues to be experienced by people. In fact, I'm going to do something a little risky right now, and I'm going to ask you to respond, but respond truthfully. I don't want to set you up to respond uh, in any other way except to be able to be absolutely truthful. I want to know in this room tonight, if you're at home watching online, or wherever you might be, you can do this as well, even though I may not be able to see your hand at this moment. But if you would say that your life has been changed, that you know that you, in a very specific way, met Jesus, and Jesus changed your life, and you know that he's real because he lives inside of you, would you raise your hand right now? Get your hand up. Look, look around, okay? These are people that can say, I'm not just depending upon their testimony. I have a testimony myself, amen? Amen. That, and I will tell you that if we were to go down through history for almost 2,000 years, we would see people. test. You can read church history and know that all throughout the centuries, even through the dark ages and the most difficult periods of time in history, the, 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 the message of the gospel still made its way out to people. It still changed people's lives. Let me take you to my last point. Are you ready for the final one? And really, the final point is more of a summary point than it really is a point in and of itself. But I want to summarize with this point. Jesus provided, here's the point. Jesus provided the proof through his resurrection that he was, is, and always will be the Son of God. God himself, the Savior, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Very important to understand. This is extremely important to grasp here because we live in a world right now that wants to present lots of different ways to God. And when Jesus came, he came and accomplished the pathway of salvation. And there, he is the one way. Jesus did not say, I am a way, I am a truth, I am a life. He did not use that indefinite article. He used a very specific article. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Now, to say that, you better be able to back it up. If you're going to present yourself to the world as the way and the truth and the life to get to God, you better be able to back it up. And I'm here to tell you this weekend that we celebrate Easter because Jesus proved it by his resurrection. He backed up what he said. He backed up and said, let me show you that I am the way, the truth, and the life. You kill me, you crucify me, you put me in the grave, but I'm coming back out again. Okay. You can't keep me there. Okay. Because I am, I am the resurrection and I am the life. And so when he came out of that grave, he was declaring, I am the way and I am the truth and I am the life and no one else has ever done what I have done. They put me in the tomb and they crucified me, but death could not hold me because there was no sin in me. Even though I actually paid the price for sin, there was no sin found in me. So death could not hold me and the Holy Spirit breathed into that tomb and Jesus came out alive as our risen redeemer and our risen Savior. He proved who he is. And here's where I want to talk to you. You got to respond to this thing. You got to make a decision because the one word that John presents over and over in his gospel is believe. It's the one word that he lays out time and time again. Believe, 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 believe. And so he, he really is bringing us to that point. I'll read it again for you in just a moment. But he's pushing us to make a decision. He's pushing us, encouraging us. He's actually helping us to come to that point of saying, what are we going to do with this information? Will we believe it or will we reject it? Will we believe or will we choose not to believe? And every human being who hears the gospel message has to make a choice. Listen to what he said, John 20, 30, and 31. We begin there tonight. Let me conclude there. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, 
which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. Dear ones, let me tell you, believing is not a feeling. Believing is a decision. You look at the facts and you say, am I, am I going to believe this or not? And I will tell you that when I was seven years of age, I went to bed one night and I began to feel the stirring in my heart. My father was a pastor, so I'd already heard many, many messages, many times the gospel had been preached. And I went to bed one night and I couldn't go to sleep. Seven years old, couldn't go to sleep. It's tossing and turning in my little bed because the Holy Spirit was dealing with my heart. He was reminding me of the fact that even though I was seven, I was still a sinner because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And I needed a Savior, and I was aware of that. I became convicted and realized, I, I want to know how I have Jesus in my life. And so I, I called out, Dad, could you come into my room? Dad, could you come over here and talk to me for a minute? And I said, Dad, I, I want to be saved. I want to make sure that Jesus is in my life. And I felt that convicting work of the Holy Spirit. And there that night, my father pulled out his old Bible, and he walked me through the book of Romans. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But God commended his love toward us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. And landed me in Romans chapter 10. Son, if you'll confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For the heart man believes to righteousness with the mouth confession is made to salvation and there that night as a seven year old little boy I knelt down beside the bed with my dad and I prayed that prayer and I confessed Jesus as Lord of my life and I'll tell you something he's been with me since that time he's never left me <laughs> haven't been perfect all that time I've made some mistakes along the way. How about you? You want to go ahead and say, hey, I've been in that boat too. Okay. But he never left me. He's never left me. He's been with me every step of the journey. Why? Because he's not a Savior that was. He's a Savior who is. Okay. He's with you. And I want to encourage you, if you've never made the decision, to believe that this weekend is your night to say, your time to say, I am putting my faith in Jesus. It is founded on a solid foundation of belief. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity that we've had to study your word. We're grateful, Father, that you've spoken to us in a real way tonight. We pray, Lord, that you'll just bring this home to us and let decisions be made. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. I would like to close today by giving you an opportunity to ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life. Would you pray with me right now? Right where you are, just simply bow your head with me, and I'm going to give you a prayer to pray, and you can simply speak this prayer out, whisper this prayer out, and from the sincerity of your heart, call upon God, and I promise you that He will hear and answer you. So let's pray together. Start by simply whispering the name Jesus. Let there come uh, from your heart just the declaration of His name. Say, Jesus... I know that, that I am a sinner, that I have fallen short with you. I'm sorry for all of my sins. Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that you are God's Son. I believe that you are the Savior of the world. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. And I believe that you rose from the grave, that you are alive today. Now pray these words. Say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Give me a new start in you. I commit my life to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer with me, I want to encourage you with a promise from God's Word that says that when we call upon God's name, we call upon the Son of God, there is salvation that comes to our lives. He changes us from the inside out, and you become a new creation. All things pass away. All things become new. And that's exactly what has happened to you today. Your next step really is to make sure that you get into a good Bible-believing church. And you begin to study God's Word, get God's Word in you, and to make sure that you get a copy of the Bible if you don't have one and begin to read it. Spend some time every day in prayer. 
And I would encourage you also to check out the resources on our website that will help you to get going in your relationship with Jesus. You can find them at church-redeemer.org. Get those into your hands. Get started in your new life with Jesus Christ. Thanks again for joining us today. May God bless you, and we look forward to seeing you next time.